everybody um, to the series we are doing on seeing groups start. And today is a little different. It's not just about seeing groups start. We're going to talk about actually seeing groups continue. And while I realize that, um, you know, the element of raising the sales is not seeing groups continue maybe for a reason, because that's not all under our control. Um, when for that matter, seeing groups start is not all under our control either, but um, maybe we even have less control about whether the groups continue or not. I think that the reality is we, there are some things that we can do in our groups and as we are coaching others in their, um, in starting groups and in, and in working with groups that could help the groups to continue. And um, just to give you a little um, um, notion of what sparked this for me, we had the meeting in Lubbock where we gathered um, different ones of us gathered in Lubbock for um, to just spend those days together. And anyway, Stan Parks was with us. And one day um, we were I was having lunch with Stan and a bunch of us were and I was asking him, had the opportunity to ask him the question about some issues we're having. We have a continual issue um, that we face over and over with our groups. And I was just sharing it with him and asking him, what should I do? Is there anything that we could do that I could help people to do with the groups to help them to continue? And he just asked me a couple of questions, which I'm, you know, I've been told that that's what he mostly does is ask questions. And he just asked me, he said, well, did you prepare them before beforehand to face that? And that just, that just really struck me like, no, I, I never prepared the people in my group, the groups I was starting, I never actually prepared them ahead of time for this. But he said, if it's something that you see happening, then you should anticipate that that's going to be happening and you need to prepare the people ahead of time. And so I recognize there are some trends that we all um, see, at least here, we see with our groups, different scenarios where things we have to deal with over and over that cause groups to fail, to disintegrate, to putter out, whatever you want to say. And so I've, we've been doing some thinking here of how we can better strengthen these groups prepare them to weather what is ahead. That doesn't mean that every group is going to make it, and it, it, that's not what this is about, but this is about doing everything that we can to help them to continue. So I just, um, we're going to break out here in a few moments um, and go through some, work through some scenarios in random groups. But before we do that, I just wanted to mention quickly some things that people have shared with me and I have many more um, we're going to do another session in the in the months to come on this but there are just some things I think I want you to keep in mind as you work through the scenarios today and so um, I'm just going to share those quickly one of the things is we need to prepare people for the draw of the legacy church because that can be an issue we've had groups that have been sucked in by legacy churches or people that have quit um, maybe they've even come to Christ, but instead of um, forming a simple church, they've gone to a legacy church. So that's something we need to think about. And in sort of the same vein, we need to um, um, advise our people that we're coaching and um, that are doing groups, we need to advise them to beware of traditional Christians who may interfere and tell them things that aren't necessary and that aren't mandated in scripture. So we need to prepare them for that. Um, one thing that we um, have recently been talking about is that it's good to connect with more than one group leader. So if you have a, um, a potential person of peace leading a group, it would be good for you to not just meet with that person or coach that person, but to coach at least two people that are in the discovery group for the sake of you, if one of those leaders flakes out, that you still have a connection to the group. And then another um, part of this is that um, we need to init, um, make sure that we are instilling in the groups we start the DNA, um, the, D the proper DNA, the DNA of disciple making so that um, those um, elements are there. And that is especially true of them focusing on obedience and sharing, because as you know, obedience is what causes transformation. As we obey the word of God, that's when we release God's power. That's when God starts working in us to change us. And then the sharing is what causes multiplication. And so if those two things are not happening in our groups, our groups will not see transformation and they won't multiply. So we have to keep those things um, 
there. And the final thing I wanted to mention is consistency, helping the groups to establish consistency. And whatever that you can do, even you yourself with your, as you meet with the leader, to make sure that you are being consistent and never leave a meeting without arranging for the next meeting. Always um, be looking um, for every way that you can to help that group get established um, in con being consistent, having a regular meeting time and help your leaders think through that because there's a lot of issues that cause groups to um, dissolve that have to do just with scheduling and just the logistics of meeting up. So helping people to work through really practical things in those ways. So these are just a few things, y'all. I could literally share for two or three sessions some good things that um, people have been telling me recently. But I, I want you to have the opportunity to think through some of these um, scenarios that um, I'm proposing. These are actual things that I've heard from people or that we ourselves have experienced here. And um, so we're going to break up into some random groups in just a minute. And when we do, um, there, you'll have two scenarios that is assigned to your group, two scenarios to read through. And um, I, what I want you to do as you read through them is to ask yourself, um, how could I help this? How could I help these people? What is it that, um, you know, I know if I was, do, if this was my group, what could I have done to prepare it better? What advice would you give me to um, help people prepare? I mean, yeah, to help prepare my group better, or what could I do in the midst of whatever's going on to maybe have had a different outcome? So I'm looking for advice from you. This isn't just advice for me. All of these scenarios are not mine personally or, or people that I've worked with here on our team, but they are um, variations of um, scenarios that I've been told recently. And so I think um, maybe you'll even come up you know, maybe some there'll be some things familiar for those of you who are like me that have seen a lot of groups start, but and not as many groups continue as you'd like. So that's what we're going to be doing. Okay, I think everybody's back. I hope you had time to go through your scenarios. What we're going to spend the next few minutes doing is um, letting you give me advice. Um, and, and remember what we're talking about is what could we have done um, not what can we do now, because all of these groups pretty much have ended one way or another, and most of them are not salvageable. Um, but what could we have done during the process? That's what we're wanting to learn from. What could we have done during the process, either at the beginning when we were initially starting the group or as we were coaching the groups? What could we have done that would have made perhaps had some bearing on the outcome, could have maybe given us a better chance of the group actually um, continuing. So that's the question that we're asking. And so um, group A was um, Jim Britz and Jim Holt. So Jim um, Britz, why don't you take the first one, um, the first scenario, why don't you um, read us the scenario and then tell us what your group came up with. All right. And Tim rhymes with Jim. So Tim's going to read it. All right. So, Sue, so you want me to read the story first? Okay. If you will. I met Zach, a guy my daughter had met, and he was enthusiastic about the stories I had shared with him. He started a discovery group with the other young adults, and they loved meeting up to read scripture together. Zach's grandfather, a pastor, heard, what, heard about the group and asked Zach if he could come and see what's happening. After the grandfather attended, Zach shut down the group and wouldn't talk to me anymore. I later learned that the grandfather told Zach that what we were doing was wrong because they weren't under the covering of a church. So we talked that through and um, I just wanted to flush them all and move on. But uh, we had more wisdom in our, in our group than me. So um, well, the first the, kind of the first thing was to meet with the grandpa and to listen to his story and to figure out what what were the roadblocks for him or what were the challenges for him. And, uh, and then as we talked it through, uh, I think it was Jim said, well, what about meeting with Zach and the grandpa together? And just having that con conversation, listening well, and um, trying to cast vision for um, reaching the lost and, you know, having people grow in obedience and uh, transformation and sharing. Um, uh, good, thank you. Um, Jim Holt, did your group come up with anything else? 
Uh, yeah, for the, the first one, for scenario number one. Uh, yeah, we we're, were just talking about just uh, just instilling and uh, stuff I was getting, taking notes on, and just encouragement to look at the model from God's word, um, to prep Zach ahead of time, to have that kind of conversation potentially down the road if the grandfather was known ahead of time. Um, so being patient, instilling patience, but also God's word. Um, also encouragement to um, train up others who could be in the group, having the responsibility. So in case there was a key person not to be there, that they might be able to continue, um, even if Zach's grandfather was not on board with Zach, uh, the group might be able to maintain without Zach being there. Thank you. Um, and then scenario, the second scenario, um, Jim, do you want to share that? Jim Holt, you want to read that one and then you can share and then the other group share? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, scenario number two. I helped Brian and Megan start a group with four of their neighbors. They're pretty consistent with meeting and all committed to following Jesus, to follow Jesus. They were moving towards forming a simple church, but Brian's job transferred him to another city. Brian and Megan got busy and moved and the group fell apart. So what I got from the group as people were sharing, uh, taking notes was uh, some things that have maybe have shared with Brian and Megan ahead of time was just the importance of sharing leadership. One idea was just maybe reminding, I think mentioning Jim Brits, but passion around the responsibility each time the group was going of, hey, you read a question, you read a question, you read a question. And once again, trying to decentralize it, not so much around Brian and Megan. Um, casting vision to Brian and Megan and the group initially before the group obviously uh, closed as far as uh, multiplication that hey, this is something you could be doing receiving and multiplying uh, other groups or other individuals and uh, just another point we're just ongoing coaching slash relational connection during the week with others in the group uh, even with Brian and Megan that uh, potentially the group could still maintain even with the loss of two of its members. Thank you. And uh, Jim Brits or Tim, you got anything to add? Uh, yes, runs with Russ. So Russ, <laughs> what do you got? I, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, yeah, could Brian and Megan have the vision of starting a new group in a new place they go to and, and help them with that? Um, we were talking about possibly they could do a Zoom meeting for a while as they're separated and then so that they could it could have a smoother transition from one group to two groups because you know that the ideal thing would be that the four carry on with a new leader and brian and megan start a new group that's a great idea what should have happened is that we came out of that with two groups not with no groups absolutely um but it just got away from us and things can roll really quickly and unravel quickly and people move and they're busy and life and then you like have nothing and then you're there may be some things there that could be salvaged now um, with the person that was coaching them but uh yeah but it's really easy I understand why Jesus told him to move in with the people because it's easy to, to lose connection and life to just take over. And, and suddenly you just, every, as Jim says, they just flake out on you. So thank y'all for that. I, like I said, in the group I was in, I wish y'all had been around several months ago when we were actually dealing with some of these things. Um, now we're going to go to those who did the set B, um, B set of scenarios. And so that would be um, Grace and Kevin. And so if um, Grace, you want to take the first one, you can read the scenario and then just give us a rundown on what y'all came up with for us. Okay, thanks. My cousin Jordan started a DG with some guys he knows from basketball. Several of them grow, had grown up in the church but didn't really have a relationship with God at first. They were all excited to meet and do the studies, but over time things fizzled out. People started not showing up for one reason or another, and one guy told Jordan that he didn't, just didn't feel like studying the Bible anymore. He didn't see how it was helping him, and he'd rather just meet to play basketball. So, um, so our group, I really appreciated this because Lisa brought up in our group that um, that maybe this group didn't have enough prayer support, that maybe this group was not covered enough um, and therefore, you know, they weren't aware of the spiritual attack. 
that was going to go on to try to tear the group apart by distractions and busyness. Um, and then after that, we just talked about, uh, we had a lot of questions that we would like to ask Jordan, like, um, is he consistently, is the cousin consistently, or the cousin is Jordan, are we consistently helping Jordan before and after the meeting? Does he know, like, do we, do we know how the meetings are going? Could we have identified, you know, somebody taking over and being a teacher um, and other people not participating? Um, are we are we sharing the leadership around the group? Um, is Jordan being coached along the way? Um, is he the one that's teaching versus doing discovery? Um, and then when, it, when the guy said that he didn't see how it was helping him, um, like explore that. Maybe get to be able to get together with that guy. Why? We wanted to know why were they excited initially? What initially encouraged them about the group? And then what changed? Um, so we had a lot of questions about that and um, maybe again, I being a second person who could work with Jordan instead of just be Jordan being by himself. That's really good, Grace. Thank you for that. Yeah. And Kevin, you got anything to add? Well, uh, our group was amazing. So yeah, I, just a couple of things. Uh, they're a great group of detectives. It, it, in that story, it seemed like this just didn't feel like studying the Bible anymore uh, gave a hint that maybe they really weren't following the questions well, either the relational questions at the beginning, because, you know, you would think that would have bound the group a little bit better, or they weren't doing the obedience and sharing. Uh, it just seems like it, it's turned into more of a, an information study rather than so. I think what we would have said is to really go over the, the questions, make sure they're following the format, know the format well, that Jordan knew the format well. Uh, and then um, also to uh, set the right expectations in the beginning uh, was two of the other things we said. That's really good. And in this scenario, this wasn't our scenario, someone else's, but in this scenario, I think exactly some of the things you were saying, it happened that, that someone had just started kind of teaching. They were from a church background. That was all of them, their idea. And it just turned into a Bible st study and nobody was obeying. And that's why they weren't seeing change. All right, um, Kevin, you got the second scenario. You want to hey, read Faye read, the, Faye read the story for the scenario. Would you read it for us again, Faye? Yeah. Um, I met Dawn, an alcoholic struggling to find freedom, and I started sharing with her scripture passages of people who found freedom in Christ. Dawn was eager to obey what God was saying and to share with others. She started meeting with her roommates to study the passages I gave her. One day, Dawn mentioned she'd met a man online who was also on the path to recovery, and he told her that she shouldn't read in any version of the Bible except the King James Version. I explained about the difference in versions and encouraged her to continue reading the New Living Translation since she could understand it better than the King James. Two weeks later, Dawn went silent. She wouldn't respond to any of the messages or calls. I haven't been able to reach her since. Thank you, Faye. I think what we said out of that was uh, clearly there's a DNA problem. This should have never been an either or. It, it, we, we talk about two translations in the beginning. So, uh, and it seemed like there is too much teaching going on here, leading as opposed to discovery. Uh, the, the whole DNA didn't feel very discovery like, well, you know, discover for yourself which one of these translations works best for you. A uh, lot of leading to teaching, directing, as opposed to uh, letting them, trusting God to use whatever translation and, and uh, see that happen. And then just also uh, making, setting the DNA so that it meets people where they are and then helps them to move forward from there. Very, very helpful. Um, anything to add to that, um, Grace? Yeah, we, we talked about, uh, maybe we missed the part about at the beginning or in the midst, but we talked about how, what we might do now to help the situation. And, and um, uh, Lisa's husband, I think it was Chris, I can't remember his first name. Yes, Chris. Uh, anyway, he suggested that maybe we should organize like prayer and fasting meeting just for Dawn, just to pray for her uh, specifically. And then... Um, uh, it was Jim, um, 
I think his name is Jim. He he suggested maybe recording a prayer and texting it to her so that she could hear uh, the love and and care in your in the voice. And and then I suggested maybe just adding her to your prayer calendar and at least once a month she would hear from you via text. And then the the other thing we came up with at the very end was, you know, what if in the conversation with Dawn you had just said, um, okay, let's use the King James and go with that, you know, go with the King James instead of explaining why, why you something different. If, and then, and then down the road, maybe she'd be like, you know, this is a little antiquated. Maybe I could try something else, you know, let her discover that it wasn't, uh, you may be the best fit for her. That's really good. And Grace, I love how in both of these, you brought up the aspect of prayer, which is one of the things that we could do for all of our groups is to form, you know, a prayer team that prays specifically for our discovery groups. And we ourselves see the example of Jesus. He was fervent in praying for his disciples. And so I do think that's one thing we neglect. And so I love all the different um, angles of prayer that you brought up. Re really great. I can't take I can't take total credit. It was Lisa and Chris who were the prayer focused okay. couple there. So that, I will give them the credit for that. <laughs> That was great. Okay, now we're going to move on to group, the um, C group of questions. And that was um, David, Deans, and Gary. Y'all led that. So David, why don't you start us off with the first one? Um, you are your designated person. Read it and let us know what you discovered would help us. Yeah, who was it? I was coming in late. Who was it that read scenario one in our group? Was that, was that Jeff or anybody in my group? It was Adam. Oh, Adam, if Adam, if you'll, if you'll read, if you're still here with us. Yep, I'm still here. So it says, I met Daryl through a mutual acquaintance, started having spiritual conversations with him. Eventually, Daryl started a discovery group of some friends going through the stories of hope. As far as I knew, everything was going well, and Daryl's group was on track. One week, I found out that Daryl and his group had all actually started attending a legacy church. Daryl joined the parking team and was serving from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. each Sunday. They no longer had time to meet as a discovery group because they were all getting involved with various programs offered by the Legacy Church. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so our group, uh, right away, we picked up that, um, you know, whoever was coaching uh, this, this group, Daryl's group, um, was hoping that things were going well. So it didn't seem like they were real in touch that maybe there hadn't been ongoing coaching uh, with this group to kind of see how things were going and you know were there any issues coming up were they using the questions were they obeying so we mentioned ongoing coaching was was probably uh, lacking there uh, we also kind of mentioned just kind of casting vision up front of the expectations of kind of what this group might look like what it's supposed to do um, and, and talking about obedience the importance of obedience that, that would have been uh, important to do. Um, and then um, Chris brought up a great one, uh, uh, something he's learned from Stan about um, warning them when they got to the point of wanting to go to the, to the legacy church, not telling them what they had to do, but, but warning them that, you know, of the challenges of the legacy church, that often what we see is that you know, that slows down, stifles, or even stops multiplication, that it kind of limits the fruit uh, you know, of, of what, uh, of disciple making when, when people choose to do that, they, they can make their own decision, but, but don't let them go without warning them of those, of those struggles. And, and then we just kind of said also at the end, you know what, no matter how good of coaches we are, there's going to be some natural attrition, especially in the American culture, you know, the, the, the brick and mortar church, you know, with the preacher and the band, that's just so, ingrained in who we are that that people are gonna uh go there even even you know as best a coach as we are that's what we said for scenario one that's good thank you um do y'all have anything to add gary kyle's our spokesperson kyle mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh not really i mean i think uh he said it really well um the biggest thing that stood out to us is it didn't seem like there was a well there wasn't a good relationship between uh, the, the coach and Daryl, because it seemed like the guy was kind of shocked. Oh, he's serving in the parking lot ministry now. Like where, where was the consistent relationship to coach? 
and engage them and are, are they actually living out their I will statements? Are they actually doing their prayer calendar? Where are they at in all that? And as they're looking at that, um, they might actually be walking in obedience. And so that's a, that's a question. That's really what stood out to us. Yeah, absolutely. Those are really, those are really good insights. There was definitely a relational issue between the coach and the person of peace there. Um, Kyle, why don't you go ahead and share with us scenario two and what y'all discovered from it, and then we'll come back to David's group. Susie, our, our group was so deep that we didn't get to scenario two. Well, we I can still read it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to read it, Susie? No, that's okay. We'll just... Uh... <laughs> We'll just go without it. It was about a group. I'll just share with you. It's about a group where the leaders um, schedule changed. And so they had to keep moving their meeting time around. And um, when the leaders um, schedule returned to normal, by that point, the group had puttered out. And I actually heard this from um, Tyler and was sharing this with me about how if you can't keep consistency in the meeting time, how difficult it is for the group to continue. And that you will, if you, if you stop meeting for a short season even, or if you move the meeting time because of something, it's a precarious time and you really have to draw close to the people and you have to be, that's when you have to make sure you're connected to somebody more than just your person of peace because these are critical times when, when um, you can lose a group where a loop can, I mean, where a group can, um, can drop, a group can, can stop or fade or, or fizzle out, whatever you want to use, put her out. But um, that's, so in a time of a schedule change, that point of being consistent with, with meeting is, is critical. I think, especially in the Western culture where we have to make time to see each other, we're not naturally seeing each other in regular rhythms. So um, people, people, once they change their rhythm, it's hard for them to get back. So I think that was the takeaway from, from that one that maybe you would have had. Was there some, so Kyle, you didn't read it. Was there anything else from the group that did discover, that did do discovery about it, David? Deans, did you have anything else about it? I'm sorry, I just went right over yours. Yeah, that's okay. We, we had a few things too that were in addition to what you said. Um, you know, it, it seemed like when they did have to change the time, maybe they didn't find a time that really did work with everybody. And, you know, you do, like you were saying, you do have to work hard at finding a good time that works for everybody. Um, and, and then it seemed like, you know, sometimes that's going to happen too. And so you, have they been rotating the question asker role maybe they weren't doing that maybe you know the group fell apart after christina wasn't there because maybe they hadn't practiced sharing leadership in the group um and, and then finally um i think we said um you know the group's not totally puttered out it, you know maybe maybe whoever's coaching needs to gather that group together and just get them to really face the problem and say hey are you guys really interested in meeting together or not if you are let's figure this out together and, and let's, let's get this done. And, um, you know, if they're not really interested, we don't want to, you know, keep spending our time with, with a group that's not really interested in meeting, you know, that's good for us as the coach to know too. And then we can move on to, to other people. Yes. All these are very good. I, I don't know about y'all, but it's making me want to bring every problem I have before all of you. <laughs> And uh, let y'all help me because I, every, every answer gave me something we, I hadn't considered. So thank you for that. The whole purpose of this is for all of us to be much more thoughtful about what the dynamics are that are happening in our groups and be intentional in making sure that we have the proper DNA established in the groups and that we do build those relationships with the persons of peace and not just the person of peace, but find other, um, other people within the group to build relationships with. So it all isn't, you know, being held together by just one relationship with one person. And um, like you said, I think one of the real critical points is to rotate the rotate who leads so that there is a, it's decentralized and that there are an abundance of people who could lead the group and or facilitate. So there, there are a lot of good things that came out of this. And um, so appreciate this, but I, I encourage you, if y'all have had some groups yourself to fail, this is a good time for you to maybe gather your team and sort of do some post-mortem kind of analysis of or maybe what you could do better next time. And uh, 
So thank y'all, really great stuff, appreciate that.